uh, Guilherme, if you want to start. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, my name is Guillermo Fidalgo. Uh, me, along with Amon Goel and Alexander Moreno, will be presenting uh, on teaching Python the sustainable way. So hopefully from this, uh, what we'll try to convey is uh, the following. We try to convey uh, some ideas, uh, some uh, lessons learned, and some uh, hopefully try to uh, invite more people here at PyHab to join our training community. So let's get started. Um, so here's the outline. Basically, we're going to start with the goals of HSF training, uh, who we are, what we do. We're going to then go into uh, some uh, historical surveys um, about uh, why we do what we do. And uh, then we're going to go into the curriculum, how we actually make some of our training material. Uh, then we're going to announce our events. And then we're going to invite you uh, to contribute and join our community. And we're going to tell you ways of how you can integrate yourself and how to contribute. Okay, so uh, HSF training is a specific uh, working group and we aim to provide a training uh, material, uh, training and computing skills that are needed for researchers. Um, so we are experiment agnostic. We collaborate with different experiments and other training organizations like the Software Carpentries, uh, and we coordinate training activities. Um, we also work to develop program that helps bridge the gap between students and the experiments to reach uh, the desired level of knowledge and skills. And uh, this uh, diagram on, on the right just shows the basic building blocks of the software training. And so what we try to show here is that as we go up this, uh, this pyramid, we go from the basic skills that we need to build first and instill good practices in our students, uh, more over to uh, advanced uh, uh, skills and focused uh, schools that actually uh, take care uh, into uh, teaching these advanced skills. And we try to, uh, let's say, interconnect of these and, and put uh, of this visible to you, to the entire uh, HEP community, uh, both new and, and, and more senior uh, level uh, uh, audience. Uh, and here, so we did, this is a, a, some results from uh, a survey from 2019. Uh, where we had uh, a bunch of uh, uh, people, mostly from uh, LHC researchers. Um, and this shows us or gives us an idea of the amount of, of reach that each uh, training source uh, or learning method uh, has in terms of, of uh, effectiveness and the amount of people. So what we can take from here is that the majority of people um, uh, that try to learn some new software tool or some new method, uh, they, uh, they prefer some written material, they do recorded lectures or university uh, classes. And so that is basically what gives us uh, 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 the basis of our uh, MO of, of making our training materials and how we actually uh, develop and, and, and present and share uh, our trainings. Um, so this is uh, sort of our basis of the of the current design for the way we, we do our trainings. Uh, and as we do, we do uh, currently in HSF training, we have written material, we do recorded lectures, and so on. Um, in the next slide, what we have is uh, another image that from that same survey uh, that shows us uh, the priority or mostly the usage um, of the the scientific software tools and computing tools that are mostly used versus the one that are less used. Uh, keep in mind that this is from 2019, and so some of these uh, uh, might have been uh, changed since then, but this is also uh, showing uh, what topics at that moment we needed to give a more of an emphasis uh, in, in our training material. And so we still follow to this day, uh, more or less, this kind of structure. Um, where we focus uh, 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 a chunk of our training material towards uh, HEP specific tools, but also a big chunk uh, and a lot of effort into training uh, the, the basics based on their usage and what experiments expect uh, from their uh, researchers. 
And next, I'm going to pass it on to Aman. Yes, um, the HSF Training Working Group has been developing, designing, developing, and putting together uh, different uh, modules according to the demands and, um, and requirements of students and, and researchers. These modules are publicly, publicly available at the HSF uh, uh, Software Training Center webpage. And uh, these are divided in, di in, in, in different uh, uh, sections. So we have the basic one, where we have uh, GIT, uh, basics of GIT, uh, um, map that we did for high energy physics, uh, SSH, uh, Bash Shell, Python. We have the software development and deployment, where we have Git again, CI, CD for GitLab, for GitHub, Docker, Singularity, Unity testing. We have the C++ corner where we have some uh, uh, C++ courses and uh, also well, some machine learning and other analysis tools. And uh, we have a specific tools for high energy physics, Arbroot, Scikit-Head, um, and we have some uh, planned or in early development. I should say here that uh, all of them are in development. So they are constantly, they, we are trying to improve constantly the material of each one of these uh, modules. So um, if you want to help us, come and join us. And there are many things, interesting things to, to work on here. Um, every one of these uh, modules has this uh, structure. So for instance, if, uh, if you go to the module called Docker, in Docker, you have uh, uh, the chapters of every one of these, uh, of these um, uh, every chapter of this module. And in this, in this chapter, if you go to, 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 to every chapter, you're gonna see in detail the material of, uh, of uh, every chapter that is going to be used by the students and by the educators. We use these uh, uh, modules uh, to, uh, uh, in, in, during our workshops. So um, uh, the next one, come on, please. So uh, we use in, in the workshops these uh, modules, uh, in particular, the, the ones that fall in the basics of the HSF training curriculum. So, uh, for instance, we use the, the basic ones, such as Bash, Git, Python, Scikit, Head, PyRoot, in the Solver Carpentry Workshop. And also in the Matlodip for High Energy Physics Workshop, where we have the basics, the styling, high energy physics, and specific plotting tools. And actually, we're going to have a tutorial tomorrow uh, about this, uh, uh, well, based on the material of Matlodip for High Energy Physics. So you're welcome to, to join us. We uh, collect information before and after every workshop. Uh, so, uh, of course, the idea is to, 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 to get some feedback from the students. And uh, uh, with that information, trying to improve the quality of the, of the material that we're using. On the right side, you see two plots. And the, 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 the first one, uh, just as an example, uh, in this question, how confident are you in your knowledge and abilities when using Python? Uh, in black, you see uh, the students' uh, answers before the workshop. In I think that's red. In, in red, the, the, the answers bef uh, after the, the, the workshop. And we see how the confidence increases. In the next one, in the next one, how comfortable are you with the usage of uproot? So again, we use we see the same the same behavior. So the confidence increases after the workshop, after the workshop. So 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 we see that the workshops make a difference, an important difference. And we have here. Uh, we wanted to show you this this question in particular. This is about the root class in one of the the software carpentry workshops. Um, where we asked the students if, uh, since we had preferred a notebook, 
if they prefer to have uh, these profit notebooks or just a blank notebook terminal uh, uh, to work on. So we see here, for instance, that almost half of the, of the people are undecided. So, so they don't care if you use preferred notebooks or, or, or blank or notebooks or terminals, that's fine with them. And almost half of the people, people also say that they prefer blank notebooks terminal. So, and, and, and just a little bit, just a few people say that they prefer the, the preferred notebook. So, so these kind of questions are important uh, for us to improve uh, not only the material that we use to, to teach, but also the way how we teach. So from the uh, developer uh, side, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to use myself as an example because I joined the the, the training working group uh, a little bit a little bit that, that a little bit less than a year ago. So uh, I have improved many of my skills. Well, I think so. I have improved many of my skills. Uh, I probably I knew a little bit about many of the or some of the tools that that we are using. But I have improved, and it's not complicated. Uh, Guillermo, Aman, and all the people in the training working group are uh, always willing to help. But uh, the tools that we use here, and probably you know some of them, all of them, Git, Jupyter Notebooks, Binder, uh, Google Cola. Uh, even if you want to improve in Python and learn something about Markdown, so these are the kind of tools that we use to 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 work on the on the on the materials that we are developing. Of course, we have some challenges, and uh, uh, these uh, challenges, in particular, with the work with the software carpentries workshop, is that we depend on the instructors of the uh, uh, carpentries community. They are not always familiar with high energy physics. Also, that's not necessary, or that's not, or let's say, important when they teach uh, basics about uh, Python or Unix Share or Git. Um, but at the same time, um, some of the members of the HSF community are becoming carpentries instructors. So, so in the future, we could be less dependent on, on carpentries or the uh, availability of, of instructors in, 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 in the carpentries. Um, th this, this is very important. We need to find additional community instructors and helpers. Uh, we are uh, still a very small group. So, so we don't have enough manpower to develop and to um, uh, give or to uh, uh, develop more, more workshops, more materials and more workshops. So uh, we need, of course, also to develop a pipeline for, for educators. So, so from students to mentors to primary instructors, but uh, but uh, the the members of the of the uh, training working group now have through have gone through all this process, so so we have uh, improved in that part. But we still need to 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 uh, improve more. So um, now, as 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 we show you uh, at uh, at the beginning. Uh, we have a large number of modules and uh, we have a lot of information and the current curriculum is cramped. So we need to develop a new so solution for this. And actually we're gonna mention that in a moment and uh, Aman is gonna continue now. Thank you, Alexander and Guilherme. So as Alexander mentioned that currently we have a lot of modules spread over say different skills that are divided. But when you access the curriculum, say they're all on the same page and you see that it can get crammed with all the information. And that is when that we already have new modules in the pipeline. And we've not added them. Say, for example, we would like to add a Julia corner. But currently, I think the major holdback is that 
if we add the Julia corner to the current curriculum, it might get even more crowded and it's a little difficult to navigate. So as, as is mentioned here, like there are some limitations that students have different needs, which would need more than one curriculum. And the current design does not address that. And again, it becomes very crowded and it focuses on a very specific area of skills. So in order to deal with that, we're proposing a new solution, which is basically a central point for all of high energy physics training material. And it takes its inspiration from the Learn AstroPy module, uh, Learn AstroPy website. And what it basically does is it has all these modules divided according to tags and according to different filters where you can access, say, one particular skill that you want to or one particular difficulty of module that you want to. So it's worth looking at. And uh, here we've linked the full proposal if someone is interested. Uh, what's uh, a thing to note here is that the we would like to say inherit, since the AstroPy is an open source library, we would like to inherit their design and would like to take it further in a high energy physics context. And for that, we would uh, need JavaScript and TypeScript, uh, TypeScript. So it would be really helpful if uh, someone is interested in program to JavaScript or TypeScript. And we would we would love to have you with us and help contribute and make this vision a reality. Then we have a lot of upcoming events throughout the year. Currently, I think we do have uh, three to four events in which uh, two of them still are accepting registrations. In fact, we have uh, one cup and trees workshop, software's basic training at the end of this month, which is 28th to 30th September. And we would love for people to join. So the registrations are still open and you can find all the details on this uh, URL. Then uh, for these two schools, I think the registrations might be closed, but for the C++, you can still wait list. And I mean, it's always uh, a good idea to keep an eye out on all these uh, schools because here at this URL, we keep updating as and when the upcoming events are designed. So uh, you can always check that out. Then we do have recurring events. So we have our weekly meetings on Mondays, that is at 4 p.m. Uh, CEST. And we have hackathons for month, uh, we have monthly hackathons for helping people contribute to the HSF training working group. So we've recently had two hackathons and there is another one coming on Friday as a part of PyHeb uh, at the hacker shop. And, and I mean, we have had a great response already. Like we've seen so many new pull requests, so many new contributions. And since it's like, it's open to all and you can contribute at any level that you want to say, if you want to make a, a bug fix or you want to say redesign a page or add new content, or you just uh, want to correct a typo, every type of contribution is welcome. And these meetings and the hackathons provide real uh, entry points with low barriers for everyone to uh, contribute to the group. Then we do have recurring trainings throughout the year. Uh, we have the HSF RSF software basics training, which takes uh, three times a year. And the next one is, as I mentioned, at the end of this year, uh, at the end of this month. Uh, then we have the Matplotlib for HEP session. Uh, we do have a session tomorrow, as Alexander mentioned. So be sure to join that. Uh, it will be a small tutorial from the whole module. Then there is also the C++ training, which is upcoming in October. Uh, CIDIS primarily organizes that. With uh, in collaboration with HSF. And we do have loads and loads of more material, but we need help from the community to teach them at least say once a year. Then, I mean, if, if again, the primary question that arises is that why should someone contribute? So when, when we look at the typical open source pipeline, of course, you would uh, want to give back to the community. So that is, I mean, for me, I think primarily that has been the major reason. So as a student, I mean, how I joined the group was just from, uh, from a mail on the mailing list, which mentioned the hackathon last year. In fact, yeah. And I think it's almost been two years since then that I've been uh, attending the meetings and been contributing. And as Alexander mentioned, we want that pipeline of students, say you join as a student or you join as a helper or just someone who's interested to know what's going on in the meetings. And then you take interest and say you start making small contributions and you go forward and then become a, a bigger part of the community if you want to. So it's it's 
definitely a great way to start with open source for say someone who hasn't had any experience because again when you enter all all you need to learn or all you need to get through is uh, how to handle a github repository and how to work with markdown i mean i myself knew these things and i picked up lots of new skills on the way then you develop new skills and you gain teaching experience from these modules you can be a helper you can be an instructor you can facilitate these events i mean there is a role for everyone you get to talk to so many people from diverse communities and diverse collaborations so i mean for example all of us giving this talk we are from different universities we are we do not have a common collaboration prior to hsf and the training group helped say uh, helped us coming together get, getting to make new connections getting to learn more about the community then you help instill best practices to your students as an instructor as a teacher you get to uh, teach modules which have been tried and tested and they show a positive response you also get recognition for your contributions of course we have a page which uh, we have the hsf training page which uh, tells us all about the community and the contributions and even in the github repositories there is the contribution batch that is there and i mean if you want to have an impact and have uh, in and help HEP training might be our most effective choice. And as I said, it's it's open to everyone. You can you can just be a fly on the wall if you want in the meetings. You can join us any Monday and just see what it's about. Or say if you want, you have a new idea, you have a new idea for a module, or if you see something that you would like to say change or you think could be done better, any way you could help us as a student, as a teacher, as a helper, any way you think of it and you can start out as a student and you can become an educator. Then uh, the next question is, how do you contribute? That is, uh, we primarily have our informal communication and formal communication on the Slack workspace. That is, that provides more of a quick communication form. Then we have the uh, Google group mailing list, which basically announces all the events and all the upcoming meetings. Then we have the uh, weekly meetings uh, on Mondays at 4 p.m. CEST, and you can find the link at you can find the details at the at the Syndico, and then you can contribute to the training materials via uh, directly on the GitHub. So, say if we go to this, I'll just show quickly. I think we're almost on time. So, so this is say the HSF training uh, organization on GitHub, and here we have different links to everything. Here you see all the people that have contributed and all of the people who are making this happen. So for example, say we open the Docker page, we see how uh, there are already issues. There are issues that are marked with different labels and people help contribute to it. We have closed issues. I mean, I think we recently closed all the pull requests in our last hackathon. But as you see, everyone can contribute at any level that they want. And again, all it's all open, it's all open source, it's all on GitHub, so you can access anything you want at any time. Then, of course, uh, I think we're ready for questions, if you have for us. And I mean, as uh, earlier, a friend mentioned that, yeah, this training group is for the people and it is it does not belong to everyone. It is for everyone and it is by everyone. And it belongs to the community and we would love to have more people over and help us build a more efficient and a more diverse training pipeline. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much for that uh, very nice and informative talk. Um, we're doing great on time, so we have plenty of time for questions. So uh, please go ahead and ask them in Slido if you have them. We have a few already, so let's uh, we'll go ahead and start with those. Um, Okay, so we have one that says uh, the number of responses before the workshop on slide nine is significantly higher than the number after. Do you know why that might be? Oh, yeah. So the primary reason for this is, I mean, this is sort of a repeating trend with all the workshops. And we make sure that while registering, we send these pre-workshop surveys. And these surveys are basically to assess the skill levels of people and like basically to get an idea of where people stand in terms of their skills and in terms of things that they're comfortable with. So while registering, again, there are lots of people who do register since 
these are low barrier registrations and you do not need uh, much of, uh, you, you just need to fill out the registration and the survey. But as and when the workshop progresses, we do see that the footfall reduces. So you can even observe it in say, day one and day three. So if on day one, 70 people are attending, on day three, only 40 might be. And that's a trend I think that we uh, are trying to work on better with. And I think that's something that we have got to use to with say virtual events more or less. And in fact, like initially we used to have a cap at 100 students so that we do not over register. But now I think we have, we did increase it for one workshop because we knew that even if we have 100 registrations, we're not sure that all of them will attend. So, yeah, I mean, that's the one thing that since everything is voluntary, you have to really push people to fill these surveys and we do have to send multiple reminders and people do fill it. But yeah, you see that drop of responses because of that. So, so one thing we're currently doing is encouraging people to to fill them, to really stress that even if you don't attend the workshop or not fully attend it, you still fill out the uh, post-workshop survey to, to understand why you didn't come or why you dropped out. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, so I, I had a uh, somewhat leading question. Um, so you showed the GitHub org, which was great, but uh, does the GitHub organization, do the repositories have labels on issues that can help people learn where they can start contributing? Uh, yes, so uh, Amanu, actually, um, can you go back to the organization? There's actually a link that opens all the good first issues if you scroll up. And the last link, find good first issues. I just added that. So that should open all, all the issues marked as good first issues in the organization. Nice. Um, yeah, that's, else that's you probably good. have to figure out which module you're most interested in and, and, and then look there. Fantastic. Um, okay, and then we have another one from Graham. Uh, do you think all the training will be online or is in-person training also useful and maybe in the in the picture for the future? I think Gillian might want to answer that too. <laughs> so yeah, that's a really good um, question. And of course, in-person training is super useful and it's a quite different uh, thing and can be much more intense and can do so much more for networking and all of that. Um, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> Uh, we'll see. So, so so far, we've definitely been focusing on on the virtual events ever since the pandemic happened. But before that, we did have in person events, and I think most of the events were in person. So we had our own training style, also inspired by the carpentries for in person events there. Um, but of course, that means also limiting the recipients of the uh, training because you can never get to such a scaling effect uh, when you do in person trainings. So that's. That's uh, something you have to balance. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so let's see. Let me check Slido again. I think that looks like that's all the questions. So going once, going twice. Um, all right, well, again, thank you very much for this talk. I thought it was a really nice overview. And um, all right, let's thank our speakers and go on to.